The state-of-the-art Ed Lumley Center for Engineering Innovation is the new home to the University of Windsor's renowned Faculty of Engineering. A faculty that offers a wide variety of opportunities that prepare students to creatively solve the practical problems that face our society. With degree programs ranging from aerospace and environmental to civil and mechanical, from automotive and industrial to electrical and material, becoming an engineer has never been more exciting. There's also co-op opportunities that allow students to earn money and gain valuable real-world experience, all while completing their degree. The facility itself rivals the technical sophistication of any post-secondary institution in Canada and was constructed to meet the highest environmental standards and to provide learning opportunities throughout. Aside from world-class labs and classrooms, the Center for Engineering Innovation features a green roof, water recycling, low-energy heating, and other sustainability systems. This unique combination of our state-of-the-art facility, Windsor's unique climate of cooperation between academic, business, and industry sectors, and some of the best minds in engineering ensure that our graduates' career opportunities are outstanding. Good morning and welcome to Artificial Intelligence Breakout Session. I'm Vladimir Frenjo. I'm Industrial Technology Advisor with National Research Council Canada Industrial Research Assistance Program. And uh, very excited, to, uh, looking for, I'll be moderating this, this session. Uh, it, it is artificial intelligence is certainly a buzzword uh, and a hot topic uh, in industrial automation. And I hope uh, we all get to, to hear some really good tips and, and learn a bit more about it today. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, the first, uh, the, the session is uh, 45 minutes and each speaker gets around 15 to 20 minutes. And the question and answers, please post your questions there. Uh, we will uh, try to cover as many as we can within, within the time. If uh, in the event you don't get your question answered, please contact the speaker uh, on the chat. You can uh, contact any, any, anyone attending the, the conference. Uh, the, the first uh, uh, speaker is Dr. Mo Abuali. He's the CEO and managing partner of IoT uh, Co., the Internet of Things company. He's a strategic and transformative technology and business management leader with 20 year record of achievement in manufacturing. Most serves manufacturing clients in automotive and discrete manufacturing, providing industrial IoT and predictive analytics technology and services, as well as uh, IoT Academy for Industry 4.0 training. Mo has a doctorate degree in industrial engineering and has worked with companies like IBM, Procter & Gamble, Amron, and Toyota. Welcome, Mo. Thank you so much, uh, Vladimir, and uh, thank you to the... Uh... Windsor Essex community for the invitation. Um, just please give me a confirmation if you can see my slides. Yes, it's looking good. All right, so uh, I'm here today to present applications uh, that focus on manufacturing and uh, our vision for this presentation actually and, and the knowledge we wanna share is how you can use industrial artificial intelligence to drive toward uh, a zero downtime, zero defects uh, mode of manufacturing. Um, I will only introduce IoTCo with one simple slide. Um, our DNA as a company is the automotive industry and uh, we serve uh, discrete manufacturing. Uh, there are many Canadian-based manufacturers that we work with today, uh, some of the logos you see there. And today I'm gonna focus the conversation on smart factory applications and I will focus on the use of predictive analytics and AI uh, to drive improvements on the shop floor. Uh, so there is really four things I'd like to discuss here in the short presentation. And if you have any questions, again, just put them in the Q&A or uh, you can reach out to me directly. Uh, so again, what is IoT? What is Industry 4.0? And what is the role of predictive analytics? So setting the stage. Um, I will give some hints on the technology that is driving predictive analytics. Um, I'll talk about some relevant use cases, uh, primarily around robotics and machining, and uh, I will give a short summary. So the, the field of the Internet of Things is, uh, you know, by no means a new field. Uh, it might be a new naming, uh, but for many decades, 
uh, organizations have been using the internet, uh, they've been using uh, analytics, uh, they've been using connectivity to drive improvements. Uh, so especially safety critical and highly regulated industries like aviation, mining, and, uh, and the energy, power plants, and so on. But the industrial Internet of Things field, uh, where I will focus on today, is really focused on leveraging the uh, fourth industrial revolution or Industry 4.0 to achieve a convergence in the factory. So you have your IT systems, like your ERP on the, on the business layer, and you have your OT, your operational technologies, like your machines and lines and uh, PLCs. And in many cases, uh, there is a lack of convergence. Uh, so Industry 4.0 is an initiative that really drives the usage um, of digital and analytics tools to help companies uh, achieve a new form of production. And when we talk about analytics, um, I always like to start with the business case. So why would you implement AI and predictive analytics on the factory floor? I think starting with the business case is very important. And the business case conversation drives uh, an ROI thinking of how to connect and capture data and then the type of analytics that should be implemented and how you can leverage AI and specifically machine learning uh, techniques and then how the technology can be scaled across the operation and how it can converge in these uh, layers of your operation that you see here. So what is the business case? Um, you may be measuring some of these metrics today in your operation, uh, but one of the key metrics is OEE. That's the overall equipment effectiveness of the plant. That's your uptime, that's your performance, that's your quality. And uh, it's very important uh, when, when implementing AI or predictive analytics solutions um, that you select the right plants and the right critical assets to implement the technology to enable you to have the improvements that you can see here. This is actually a survey that we uh, conducted uh, with some manufacturers, including Canadian manufacturers, and it's showing some of the improvements that they've been able to achieve uh, by implementing AI solutions on the factory floor. So if we specifically look at predictive maintenance as a quick example, uh, we are not just talking about predicting uh, and detecting downtime, but we're also talking about improvements in spare parts on hand, so by having a proactive and a predictive maintenance uh, schedule, uh, you can actually uh, reduce spare parts. Uh, you can improve your maintenance metrics, like in mean time between failures and mean time to repair. And you can do predictive scheduling uh, on the factory floor. Uh, you can also use and leverage AI technology for predicting quality issues on the shop floor. So you can receive data from the, from the machine. You can look at process parameters. Uh, you can use uh, uh, images or image AI or, or video analytics, uh, pictures that are coming from, from cameras, for example, and uh, detecting and predicting a scrap with a high level of accuracy. So uh, I think it's important to, to note that uh, based on surveys and conversations, you know, these, these technologies are a reality. Uh, they are not a concept, and uh, they have been proven and validated in the industry today. And many manufacturers are driving their uh, zero downtime, zero defect journey and uh, leveraging AI to achieve uh, full ROI within usually a three to 12 month uh, pilot uh, duration or implementation. So I will sh actually focus on predictive maintenance in this presentation. And uh, I'll show three quick use cases uh, after which we will go into the technology. Um, but this is just uh, an example actually um, of implementing AI solutions uh, in a variety of manufacturers. Uh, so NAM is the National Association of Manufacturers, and they actually uh, have an AI analytics leadership award that they give out on an annual basis since uh, the year 2019. Um, and some of these uh, manufacturers have been receiving this award actually on an annual basis. Uh, so why, right? How did AI support these manufacturers to make improvements? So first and foremost, it's about the technical value that the AI solution is bringing to the manufacturer. Second, it's about velocity. It's about speed in the right direction. So implementation speeds, which are usually uh, within about three months. So within a 12-week period, 
you can actually implement a live AI solution in a, in a practical setting. Uh, third, it's about scalability. So once you implement a template of an AI solution, you're able to roll that solution across additional plants and uh, the ability of having your internal team, your internal uh, center of excellence perform the rollouts yourself. Okay. Um, last but not least is the return on investment that these companies have been able to achieve. Uh, some companies have achieved the uh, ROIs uh, within six months. Um, this example here is actually a predictive quality uh, use case in the aluminum die casting industries, high pressure die casting. And uh, we actually call this project the power of 1%. So a 1% scrap reduction in a mid-size casting operation uh, was almost a quarter million dollar in savings annually for this plant. Um, so the, the ROI speaks for itself. And it's just a matter of understanding what's critical for your business. Um, in this case, it was a wheel manufacturing operation, which was uptime critical. In this case, it was a casting operation, uh, which was uh, a quality critical. And in this case, it was a hot forging application. It was a very unique process uh, where vibration monitoring was used to measure and detect some of the critical areas of the, uh, of the forging machine. So uh, keep, in, keep in mind the ability to gain ROI using AI um, and, and how these solutions uh, are proven in the industry today and could allow manufacturers, uh, large or small actually, to embark on this, uh, on this journey. So technology, um, regardless of the solution that you select, it's really a three-layered approach. The first layer is data, right? What data is required to leverage predictive analytics on the factory floor. And there is multiple data sources, right? Some data is coming from the, the controller, the PLC or the CNC. Uh, some data is coming from add-on sensors like a vibration or uh, images coming from cameras. So the ability to have a multivariate model and to bring controller data together with uh, quality uh, process and sensory data into an AI-based engine that enables you uh, to achieve maintenance and quality improvements. So the user experience at the end of the day or the main use cases um, uh, leverage or generate uh, three key metrics for the organization. So what is the health of the machine or the part that is being produced by the machine? Uh, what is the remaining life prediction? So when will this machine or component of the machine uh, fail? Of course, with a level of accuracy, um, and what is the diagnostics? What is the root cause of failure on this uh, on this machine uh, or on the part that is being produced? So the user experience is very important uh, and keeping in mind that, you know, the maintenance and quality organizations would be leveraging this. And uh, of course, we have to design for the user. So we would not expect uh, maintenance or quality to be a PhD or a data scientist. So they are maintenance and quality professionals and therefore the solution needs to add value uh, to what they do. So right here in the middle is actually um, a library of solution templates, which really vary depending on the manufacturing process. And again, there's a lot of processes out there. Uh, so it's important to kind of templatize and provide uh, the right analytics for the right use case. So we're talking robotics, uh, where we are monitoring each uh, servo axis or joint on the robot and we're, we're able to predict issues with the joints. And I'll show that use case. We're also talking about machine tools, uh, grinding, milling, lathes, turning, and so on, where vibration sensing is used, for example, to sense the uh, spindle bearing and, the, and monitor the condition of the tool. Um, and the controller parameters from the machine are used to measure issues with the ball screw or the linear axis on the machine, your, your XYZ axis, for example. Uh, there is even opportunities to look at the uh, coolant or hydraulic system, your pumps, your motors. So we'll talk briefly about machining. And then there is advanced use cases in the casting process, molding process, welding process, where there is a lot of data parameters. And there's also a correlation of the process data to the quality of the cast or the quality of the mold or the quality of the weld that is being uh, produced on the part. Uh, also, stamping equipment, press machines, um, where you, we have to monitor the dies and we have to monitor the key areas of the press. 
including the, the main shaft, the bearings, as well as the ancillary equipment that you see here, which are surrounding the machines, uh, surrounding the lines, uh, including pumps, motors, gearboxes, but also the ability to look at the building systems like uh, compressors and, and chillers. So it's important uh, to implement uh, AI solutions on the critical assets within the operation that are uptime critical and quality critical. And it's important to understand that behind the scenes, there is a machine learning analytics process. There is a systematic process to implement AI and the subset of AI, which is machine learning. Um, it's, it's mathematics and statistics that allow you to take that data model, again, multi-source, multivariate model coming from the CNC sensors, uh, controller data, and so on, and building a multivariate model that can process that data, number one, ingest and process the data, number two, sorry, and extract features, meaningful statistical metrics from the data, and then train a health model that can become predictive and diagnostic, okay? And you may have heard the, the two philosophies out there. There is unsupervised learning and supervised learning. Uh, unsupervised means that we don't have labels for the data. We don't have historical data. So we only know the current condition of the machine. So that current condition can be used to train a machine learning model, which is relevant for that machine, whether it's a robot or a CNC machine or whatnot. And then the ability to measure the drift or the degradation away uh, from that baseline health um, and then to become predictive and diagnostic. This whole process here, if properly conducted, can be completed in about eight to 12 weeks. So within two to three months, you can actually have a running ML solution in a practical setting, okay? Um, this is just a very quick implementation framework. The only thing I wanna mention here is there is really multiple sources of data flowing. There is machine data, there is uh, sensor data in some cases, and it's important also to be able to speak to the outside world, right? So when the predictive solution makes a decision, it has an application interface or an API where it can send data to the uh, PM system, your maintenance system. Uh, it can create a work order automatically, or it can even request a spare part automatically from your maintenance system. So this closed loop architecture is important to uh, ensure success in uh, AI so that you can leverage the IT systems uh, within your organization. So two very quick use cases. The first one is on robotics, okay? Uh, with robotics, uh, data is collected directly from the PLC. There is no add-on sensors required, okay? There is a lot of failure modes that occur on a robot, which can be measured and predicted using an AI solution. Uh, very high impact, high cost failures, like backlashes and bearings and so on. Uh, but of course, you know, the PM cycles would continue on some of the other uh, issues like cables and dead batteries that cannot be predicted. So some, some data that's being collected from each of the joints or axis of the robot would include the, uh, the current and the torque and the speed, the position, the temperature, uh, and so on. And then by using AI, uh, the uh, end user experience is very important, right? You have to be able to visualize information uh, the user is not a PhD or a data scientist. The user is a maintenance professional. So he or she will be able to look at machine health and look at predictions and look at diagnostics uh, and be able to make decisions in a proactive fashion. If we take CNC machines as another quick example, it's a very complex asset. There's a lot of moving parts. You have a tool, you have a spindle bearing, you have a ball screw, you have a coolant system. So having a data model is very important, data that's coming from vibration, spindles, and so on. And then the ability to, again, use machine learning, create a multivariate model that enables you uh, to show intuitive information for the end user. Again, what is the health of my machine? When is my machine gonna fail? And what is a diagnostic? Uh, in this case, we're using vibration data. So you can actually look at the harmonics of the failure you can diagnose if the machine is having an outer race failure or an inner race failure on the bearing. So with vibration, some in-depth uh, diagnostics could also happen uh, on, the, on the machine. So to wrap it all together, okay, um, you know, it is a journey and the journey starts 
uh, by looking for and, and finding your proof of value, okay? Um, these are not concepts. These are proven solutions that are available in the field today. And those solutions uh, have to be proven for your organization. So assess where you are in your journey and the type of data and the, the type of plans and criticality of the assets that you have today. Um, run workshops, technical workshops to design these solutions properly and understand the business case. Uh, implement pilots that run for about 90 days uh, that allow the technology to be proven and the business case and ROI to be proven. And then come up with a scalability approach and also empower your internal team and higher skill sets that make sense for, for maintaining these solutions, as well as partnering with universities like University of Windsor and others to kind of disseminate that knowledge about data science, AI, um, and industry 4.0. So keep that zero downtime, zero defects vision. Um, consider predictive maintenance and predictive quality based on the ROI, uh, wherever you have uptime issues or quality issues uh, in, in your plants. Uh, implement templates on those critical assets and interoperate with your IT systems, right? If you have a maintenance PM system, like a PM or Maximo or others, it's important to integrate that data back. Uh, but throughout your whole journey, always, always know and acknowledge that it's about people, process, and technology. And to be very successful with Industry 4.0 and AI, it's important to have, you know, that three-legged stool and it's not just about implementing technology, but it's understanding people, process, and technology, and bringing it all together to deliver a quick ROI for uh, for your business. Uh, so I don't think we have time for questions, but uh, please reach out to yeah. me, email me, or uh, throw some stuff in the Q&A, and I'm happy to answer you. Thank you. Thank you, Mo, and thank you. Actually, even my questions that I had, you've answered them really well. So, uh, But if you do have questions, please contact Mo separately. Thanks again. And, uh, We'll, we'll have to move on uh, to the next speaker. We are a little bit uh, uh, short on time. So uh, Dr. Ryan Scott uh, is a postdoctoral fellow for diagnostic imaging research at the University of Windsor and also uh, artificial intelligence developer at the Sonics in Windsor, who is also uh, an IRAP client for, for many years. Uh, I, uh, and uh, I, uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, to Ryan's uh, brief talk of a really interesting uh, application and, and project they're working on. Welcome, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ryan, we cannot hear you. How about now? No. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of Tisonix, and uh, Tisonix is uh, a company which specializes in development of ultrasonic equipment for uh, non-destructive evaluation. Um, and we have applications in, for example, uh, manufacturing, especially automotive manufacturing and uh, medical industries. So automotive body assembly is a very fast paced uh, world and a key process in automotive assembly is resistant spot welding. And the idea for resistant spot welding is, you know, in a automotive body, we have all kinds of uh, metal sheets that we need to join together. And we're gonna join these sheets together using uh, application of significant amount of force and strong current to melt the uh, interfaces between these sheets. And this is just a, an image that shows what a, a typical uh, automotive body assembly plant might look like. Now, there are typically anywhere from 4,000 to 6,000 resistance spot welds per vehicle. They can involve many different types of metals. So you can have high strength steels, uh, mild steels, aluminum, and uh, any combination thereof. And they also come in many different uh, sheet thickness combinations. Anywhere from you know, a, a sheet that's being joined might be as small as half a millimeter all the way up to, for instance, four millimeters, depending on what the joint is um, doing. And so with all this variability in all these different uh, you know, sheets and things like this, we have um, 
you know, a strong effect on joint quality and, and consequently variability across joint quality um, given uh, a, a given part or a, a given uh, uh, position on a part. And this is affected, for instance, by uh, local density of welds. Um, if there are too many welds in a, a given location, then the current can kind of dissipate or cheat by going through pre-existing welds rather than the, the weld we're trying to make. Um, there's also, for instance, part curvature. So if there are curvy parts, um, there might be poor contact of the weld electrodes and that can uh, degrade the, the welding contact and consequently the weld is, is of poor quality. To evaluate resistant spot welds, um, the classical approach is called uh, statistical destructive testing. So this is where, um, this is depicted in the bottom left here, and this is where we actually pull parts off the line and we'll take you know, some sort of device and try and pull them apart and make direct measurements of the welds along the part. Obviously this is wasteful. We could have taken a good part off the line. Uh, it's very slow. You have to have somebody to manually pull these things off the line and, and pull them apart and measure. And consequently, it's very expensive. The current practice is uh, statistical destructive testing alongside statistical post-process non-destructive evaluation. So you might take a device like um, Tisonic's uh, F2 unit and you pull the part off the line, but we can assess it non-destructively still. So you, you basically go along it with an ultrasonic sensor at all the different weld positions and get a sense of what happened uh, for each of the welds. So this is obviously improvement. We don't have to um, destroy anything in this case, but it's still uh, statistical. So um, you know we don't have 100% traceability in this case. Going forward, we want to have semi or fully automated in or post-process non-destructive evaluation. And in order to do that, for that to be feasible in such a fast-paced world, we would have to deploy artificial intelligence solutions that automate the analysis of the non-destructive uh, evaluation data. And of course, this goes towards industry and NDE 4.0's aim of zero defect manufacturing. If we can track all of this stuff, all of, every single weld that occurs, especially if we can do this in process, we can um, try to feed back to the process control and um, fix the weld before it you know, before it's even done. And so this is just going to be the world's fastest introduction to uh, deep learning. But, um, you know, we've already heard uh, quite a bit about artificial intelligence. That's just uh, where we try to develop machines that imitate intelligence. And of course, learning is a key element of intelligence to explore your environment and uh, create a knowledge base and exploit that. That's, that's what learning is, right? And machine learning, Consequently, is a major branch of AI that aims to give computers the capacity to learn. And we can do this using mathematical modeling approaches alongside data-driven algorithms to optimize these models so that they best perform some sort of task. And machine learning itself is a huge, highly active research field with different types of subfields that have different applications. For, for instance, um, we have supervised learning and that's a field where for every uh, input sample that we provide, we also provide the expected uh, output that the model needs to, uh, such that the model needs to learn the relationship between a given input and the expected output. Reinforcement learning is a field where the model is um, basically deployed into some environment that it can explore. It has the capacity to explore and interact with its environment, and it basically learns on its own. Um, by failing, by succeeding, and you know, kind of like uh, a child growing, <laughs> um, as, you know, throughout its life. Unsupervised learning, in the classical sense, can be thought of as clustering, but it's it's much more than that now. Um, for instance, representation learning is a huge uh, topic in unsupervised learning, squeezing the most information out of something that we can in the most efficient way possible. And then lastly, deep learning. It's kind of like a Swiss army knife of the machine learning world. It can basically do it all. And so we apply this deep learning uh, in, in our work. And what sets deep learning apart from the rest of machine learning? Well, uh, machine learning you know, can take on all kinds or can, can leverage all kinds of different modeling architectures and algorithms. So for instance, you have like K nearest neighbors and deep, uh, sorry, uh, decision trees and uh, random forests and linear models and all this type of stuff. But in deep learning, we're strictly using deep artificial neural networks. And this is just a diagram that shows 
really a, a, a truly a small subset of the types of neural architectures that are out there. And each of these neural architectures has its own use cases where it's it just performs better than the rest. It's made for this type of situation. So for instance, uh, deep convolutional neural networks, these are uh, the, the classical approach now for um, anything involving, say, images or maybe even 3D data. Uh, whereas recurrent neural networks like these guys over here, those are the typical uh, network architectures used, for instance, in time series analysis. And uh, deep learning, you know, it is the cutting edge field of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And it's that's because it establishes routinely the state of the art in all kinds of different problem domains. So for instance, uh, image recognition, um, it even outperforms humans in this. So determine the main subject of an image. It can also outperform uh, dermatologists in skin cancer recognition. So just using images of uh, skin cancer, it can determine uh, more often than uh, an actual dermatologist uh, the correct uh, diagnosis. It also has applications in, for instance, medical image segmentation, uh, automated captioning, stuff like this, and even, of course, self-driving vehicles. So how does this apply to uh, resistant spot welding? Well, uh, Tesonix has this system that we call REWA, Real-Time Integrated Weld Analyzer. And the idea is that we can use an ultrasonic uh, probe that's embedded in the weld electrodes to look inside what's happening between the welded sheets. And this system produces a two-dimensional representation of the weld progress as it unfolds in time. So this image here on the right, um, vertically basically what we're looking at is a, a manifestation of what's physically happening be happening between the sheets. Whereas in time, uh, sorry, the x-axis is actually weld time, not uh, you know space. And that's because these electrodes are fixed in their position as it's attached to the welded stack. And you can see that um, you know we have this transducer embedded in the weld electrodes. The weld electrodes are just these. Um, these, these guys here above and below the welded stack. There's a transducer embedded in there which shoots an ultrasonic signal through the stack. And as the signal is bouncing off of all these different interfaces, we get this corresponding image. And so it really forms like this. Before the weld has occurred, we basically have nothing. It's just, uh, um, you know, we can see the top of the sheets, we can see the bottom of the sheets, and we can see, see the, the interface between the sheets. And then as this weld unfolds, this we get a bigger and bigger picture of the weld process and you can start to see nugget formation here and more nugget and so on until the weld is complete and you know when the weld is done we can even see that um, the molten nugget uh, solidified and we no longer see that interface between the sheets which means these sheets are joined together so some of the key things that we can observe the top of the stack the bottom of the stack the top of the nugget the bottom of the nugget and any interfaces between the sheets. And so our big idea is, OK, let's automate characterization of this ultrasonic weld data and relate that back to either process events or physical weld characteristics such that we can predict uh, or determine directly the weld quality. The classical approach for doing this automated, or sorry, automatic characterization of the ultrasonic data um, it's you know you would use for instance gating so just looking at specific regions of this image and then you know for instance thresholding the ultrasonic signal to try and identify peaks and this type of you know uh, tedious mathematical approach is unreliable we have such variability across all the possible welds it's slow and in terms of having to program that it's basically difficult if not impossible so our solution is to uh, use large amounts of data. This is a process for which we can generate lots of data very easily and apply a deep learning uh, approach to this. And we can do this either in process, so while the weld's forming, or post-process using the entire <clears throat> uh, resultant ultrasonic image. Now, in terms of the in-process approach, you can consider that time series analysis. So for each of these images, what we've done is we have the ultrasonic image, and we superimpose over top of that a uh, set of time series, which would be output by the artificial intelligence system. And so the green, yellow, red, and actually there's a purple line here, those represent the probability of an event happening. And so we track a few different key events. For instance, in green, we have the onset of nugget melting. And that's so 
when when the nugget just starts to form you can see that happens right around here uh in yellow we have the point at which the nugget breaches all uh sheet interfaces so if this here is a sheet interface this being the top of the nugget we can see that the nugget cross through that sheet interface here so this event gets fired and then in red we have the saturation point so where the nugget reaches maximum thickness relative to the rest of the stack and that's what's uh, being shown in red the purple is expulsion, so that's when molten metal gets injected from the stack and it causes a, a sharp disruption mechanically. And we see that as a uh, discontinuity in the ultrasonic signatures. And lastly, in white, that is tracking the, uh, the thickness of the, uh, the vertical thickness of the weld nugget in the, in the stack proportionally in time. In terms of post-process AI, we uh, took an object detection approach. And so basically the idea there is um, any key features in the image that we're trying to track, we can enclose them in bounding boxes and we can try to tightly enclose them in these, uh, these boxes and perform basically um, measurements in the real world using these boxes that we've developed. So we can find, for instance, the left edge of the nugget corresponds to say the melting point. We know where the bottom of the nugget and the top of the nugget are. We can determine the saturation point and all kinds of different things from these boxes. And you can see that there are a lot of different boxes with, with redundancy on the edges. And that's by design so that, you know, if one box, for instance, is not found, well, hopefully another box covered it. And you can see it, it's operating very strongly in a lot of different uh, types of welds. These differ in terms of the number of sheets, the types of materials, um, the thickness of the, the sheets, and so on. Um, we can also track expulsions here. So uh, you can see that uh, we have the expulsion bottom and the expulsion tops, and they're well aligned. And, and from that, we can determine the positions of different, different expulsions. And we can even track more than one expulsion in a given case. Uh, if there is no nugget, it would appear like this. No nugget boxes are shown. And we know from, from this that there was no, no uh, weld in this case. So that's obviously very bad. And so overall, our performances um, across these different uh, things we're trying to characterize, the nugget, the stack, and expulsions, we have over 99.5% detection rate with less than half percent false positive. And with respect to the false positives, usually they're in, you know, inconsequential. Like we identified a nugget, but it's very small. Uh, to the point where we consider it a bad weld anyway, for instance. Or we can just rectify them directly. So with this artificial intelligence system that we have, this enables us to have 100% traceability of welds. Um, this AI system is super fast, so before the, the next weld is even started, we've already finished an um, analysis of the previous weld. We also have the capacity for predictive maintenance, which I just talked about in, uh, to some extent in the previous talk. Um, so for example, weld electrode cap wear, these caps, uh, there are copper caps that are pressing against the, the welded stack for every single weld. And these things get worn over time. The, the caps start to flatten more and more, which means we lose current density, which means the welds get poorer and poorer over time. And so we can predict that directly and feed that back to the system. Uh, we can also do trend analysis either by part or by weld. And over here on the right, what you're looking at is these are different parts. And for a given uh, part code, you can see all the joints that are made along that part, and you can start to see a trend. So if we just looked at all of the parts that, that have this code, we can start to see that, for instance, in this position, we consistently have bad welds. So then we can look at why. Um, and then lastly, um, either in the in-process or post-process case, we can automate uh, process control by feeding back to, for instance, the weld controller or something like this so that we can actually um, fix welds that are, are going poorly before they're even done. And so we have our rewet system. It's producing these ultrasonic images and marking them up with, with the AI's output. And then we uh, project them in our uh, graphical user interface to show, um, you know, for instance, in this case, we see a nice, really big nugget. That's a really great weld. So we give it a green check mark. In a case like this, we don't see any nugget at all. That's a bad weld. And over here, we have a smallish kind of late bloomer of a nugget. And so we'll give that a yellow um, uh, indicator on the screen. Now, last, yeah. um, moving we're running, forward. We're running, we're running our, out of we're, time a little bit. If you can wrap it up. Uh, yeah, this is my last slide. Yeah. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. So you can see that we're doing a cross-section through the welded stack at a fixed position. 
the next generation, we want to measure lateral growth throughout the welding process as well, rather than just trying to determine that through uh, correlations. We also want to improve our AI, sorry, our AI approach by enhancing our nugget and stack models. And what I mean by that is instead of encasing these in boxes like this, which you know can lose a lot of information, we want to directly track the uh, nuggets and the stack um, at every position throughout the entire welding process, such that we have uh, targets that look like this or like this. This will give us better relationships with the physical uh, product or process, and consequently, we have a more informative weld evaluation. That's it for me. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, we don't have that much time. I'm sorry about that. Okay. If you have questions, just click on people, find Ryan, or, or Ryan can put his contact on chat as well. Yeah. And if you connect with Ryan directly, you can message him directly and, and uh, you know, hopefully, you know, spend more time i know these topics uh, uh, take time uh, I'll, I'll i'll move to the the next uh, speaker it's a uh, scott robinet uh, is a co-founder and chief software ar architect of volteric inc a company that provides cloud-based industrial uh, and energy optimization and analytics software uh, at volteric scott has concentrated on creating solutions to address the unique challenges that iot data presents and the role of ai and machine learning in transforming data into actionable insights uh, scott welcome vladimir uh, and uh, thank you all for uh, for attending um at Volteric, we're, and I'll try to, uh, in the interest of time, we'll try to, I'll actually able to rip through some of the, um, some of the first slides pretty quickly because the other, uh, the other presenters have done such an excellent job of introducing, uh, these, these concepts that we're discussing, uh, during this, um, during this breakout session. So I'm going to attempt yeah. to, we, we, we can continue until 10 45, the, the other session we will miss some attendees might miss the introductions, but, uh, I would say we have 15 minutes. Okay, great. Uh, just confirm you guys uh, can see the screen yes the screen looks good and you sound good mm -hmm. excellent so as the other presenters have done a, a great job of uh, of explaining as well um we're all here about talking about the smart factory and the industrial fourth revolution and where ai and um the the, the future of automation uh, resides in this in this sphere um Ryan explained this as, as well, the difference between artificial intelligence, see, simply put, I, I suppose, is a way to describe any system that can re replicate tasks previously acquired of intelligence. And how machine learning fits into this um, is the machine learning is the actual um, part that provides the capability of artificial intelligence. And it requires a large amount of data, uh, decision logic, modeling, uh, everything that we've uh, already talked about a little bit um, in the previous uh, presentations. Um, and also, it's just to reiterate that, that this revolution is real and it is, it is happening. There's been numerous studies that have been done um, across, uh, across the board uh, showing how companies that have adopted AI, uh, that are adopting machine learning, that are adopting these new uh, approaches in utilizing uh, computational uh, processes, have uh, improved maintenance, have improved, pro improved profit, uh, improved uh, minimized um losses and 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 um and 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 problems with everything from manufacturing all the way down to retail and, and energy which is what uh Volteric has begun to, to to concentrate on more specifically um so why is this all suddenly seem to be taking off as as it is now in in 2021 um as mo had mentioned this has been going on for a while um, but there were a lot of uh, problems with getting these things off the ground in the past. There, were, there was a lack of standards. Uh, there was a minimal number of sensors on the market, and the ones that were out on the market tended to be very expensive, uh, complicated, and faulty. Um, forces of tradition, there, there was a, I suppose you could say, a, a bit of a resistance to learning these new concepts or using these new technologies in something like uh, industry and energy. Um, there were physical barriers. So what I mean by that is actual, you know, problems with the wiring sensors together and finding ways to uh, route these kinds of data uh, acquisition 
systems uh, on a factory floor or um, in a in, in an airplane, even any of these different areas um, where there are actual physical problems with that. And then there are IT barriers, right? There was the idea that uh, computers were, that could process this kind of information were expensive and they were in data centers, or if you were lucky, you had a data center in your building, but um, these systems weren't really built for these kinds of things. Now, um, there are standards and cooperation across the field. There's uh, software standards, there's IT standards, there's uh, thanks to the internet, there's a way for all these devices to start talking to each other in a known language or in known protocol so that uh, there's a much wider, uh, broader ecosystem of players that can help and explore and research these ways of, of, of doing this kind of uh, AI. Um, many more sensors on the market. I mean, we've all seen that you can't even buy something uh, for, for a factory or for an energy system or even for your own home nowadays that doesn't have some kind of sensor capability on it to some degree. Um, there's market innovation forces. We've all heard in Industry 4.0. Um, there is a, a a drive to do these things now to improve profit, reduce um, reduce downtime. Um, there's there's financial reasons to start doing these things. Um, the physical barriers are torn down. You've got 5G uh, that's finally starting to roll out. Uh, wireless and Wi-Fi, all these things that help sensors solve the problem of no longer having to wire fiber optics necessarily or having to wire ethernet to connect these systems. They can all be done, all be done wirelessly. Um, better IT choices, right? Just look at AWS, um, Google Cloud, uh, Microsoft Azure. These, uh, these platforms as a service provide companies and solution providers almost an infinite amount of programming power for pretty much anything that you would need to do from an AI deep learning, running a web server, any of those can be done now at a much lower cost and without having to have these kinds of hardware and uh, IT systems uh, on site. Uh, and all of these, of course, have been brought about primarily by the internet and the emergence of cloud computing. So some of the promises of AI, uh, as we've all been talking about product design improvement, operational optimizations, uh, predictive maintenance is a big one. And then also cybersecurity, uh, which as we're talking more about sensors and talking more about the automated uh, industry and about tying factories together, uh, cybersecurity is starting to become uh, a very, very big, uh, very big concern requiring its own AI approaches uh, to solving, uh, both because of humans and hackers sitting in front of keyboards trying to do these kinds of hacks, but also AI being used to cause cybersecurity issues and, um, and and how AI can almost be used to fight itself in that regard. But that's an entirely different conversation. So um, what I would like to concentrate a little bit on this uh, pr presentation is a practical example of something that we've done at Volteric from a software standpoint, because Volteric being a software company, uh, we concentrate much more on the software uh, implementation of AI, um, data collection, data aggregation, managing data flows, and then emitting that data out into something that can be used by end users at multiple layers of uh, a business. So from uh, management, C-level execs, uh, down to mid-manager, all the way down to engineers and uh, product development and design uh, personnel. So one of the projects we've done recently is a uh, electrical vehicle uh, charging uh, system that has been custom designed to work with electric tugs at an airport. And this charger is a uh, ground up new uh, engineering build that has a little bit of everything in it. So it's got a PLC system in it. It has uh, an, an edge box device in it, which is basically a, a, a mini PC, uh, all the related wiring, a uh, LTE or uh, soon to be 5G modem, uh, ethernet connections, uh, lights that turn on when you're plugging in the uh, plugging in the vehicle, uh, and an LCD display at the top that uh, provides rich information about the current state of the charge, uh, voltage, amperage, uh, current temperature inside outside the unit, uh, and all of this information is collected within the charger itself, uh, and then sent out through uh, the LTE or the hardware connection up into through the cloud and onto the Volterra platform. And from there, that's where we do all the, the, the AI machine learning um, notifications, uh, dashboards, uh, diagnostics, 
And uh, as the other presenters have said, we, it, it's all about tying in multiple pieces of information, right? It's not as simply as saying, uh, well, this is using a lot of voltage and therefore there's a problem. Um, what our clientele is really interested in is, is using multiple layers of that information, weather information, uh, information from their, their current maintenance system, uh, GPS information from where the tugs are going, how often they're using uh, particular tugs, and tying all that together to get a much greater understanding, not just of how these chargers are used, um, which is important because they want to know where they're going to place new new uh, new charges in the future. They want to know what what airlines, for example, are using which ones more often, uh, what tugs, but more specifically, what batteries and of what types are using these chargers and how often they're using them. But to start using that machine learning AI to start predicting where new machines should should go in the future, but also identifying ways to optimize the charge cycles for some of these batteries. Uh, are there ways based off of weather to determine if a battery should be charged more or less? Uh, if there's a high use uh, set of chargers, the charger can be power cycled uh, to facilitate maybe quick charging certain batteries that they know are going to be used uh, close to the charger versus some of the lar uh, some, some other tugs and batteries, which may require a large charge cycle because they're gonna to go to another part of the airport. That ability to identify that and identify the usage patterns is something that we're seeing have multiple uses, not just in the industry, but they're already using it in retail. A small element of that is already used in detecting fraud uh, for credit card companies. Um, but aside from all of that is then getting that information in a way that's usable to the end customer or the end user and having that capability of, again, doing it based off of the target audience. So someone who is in charge of maintaining the energy chargers, the, the EV chargers, would obviously probably want to know if there's a physical problem with the charger. Whereas managers and uh, CEOs of these uh, EV solutions are interested a lot more in who's using the most energy. Is there a way to be able to bill them for that? What are the predictions of how that energy usage is going to, is going to change? Uh, are there ways of um, modifying how much energy these chargers actually use towards a battery based off of current grid use and the cost of that grid use. Um, these are all problems that have been at the airport for a long time, but they're large problems that require a more uh, automated and AI solution to really bring these kinds of insights and kinds of calls to action to the fore. Um, this is a overview of how the of, of, of how the process works at a, at a software level that the information is collected again from the physical devices from other software from other apis processed on a, on a cloud platform such as ours and then all that information again has to make its way back out to be usable so it could be a dashboard uh on a on a web application it could be uh on on phone notifications or or phone application uh, increasingly, it's API interactions with other third-party ERP systems, uh, such as SAP, uh, maintenance systems that may already be uh, in use at a place like the airport or at a, at a factory floor. But getting that information when it's needed to the right people at the right time. Um, so it, as I said, the, this particular solution identified the most used stations, vehicles, batteries, and capacities, and can intelligently power up and down, adaptive control current based off environment grill, uh, grid demand, a little bit of the predictive maintenance, but auto scheduling maintenance based off of how these tugs and EV chargers are used. Uh, and all of this is just about uh, informing decision making so that uh, anybody from our, our customer who's actually the, the EV designers can see from a product perspective, how is that EV being used how, what parts are being used the most, what features are being used the most, what features are being used, you know, the least. All the way up to, again, uh, someone like the CEO at the airport being able to say, which of these airlines are using these chargers the most? You know, how can we monetize that? How can we maintain and improve customer service based off of those usage patterns? So I wanted to conclude by saying, um, AI is a huge, huge thing, as we, as, as we all know. Um, but the most important part of feeding any kind of AR ML solution is the data. Um, and that comes up in, in all the presentations that I'm sure will, will, will be occurring today about automation. 
um, where you're getting that data, the quality and the quantity of that data. It's, it's ML, if, if nothing else, and AI is starting to show that the old adage of garbage in, garbage out uh, is very real. Um, you can, the, 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 the data that comes in can very quickly uh, cause problems with the, 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 the solutions that are being derived because of that data. Um, and the data, so the data can come from various sources, but it typically needs to be distilled or, or as, uh, as Mo pointed out, you need to have a specific idea of what exactly the data is that you're going to need in order to uh, come up with the correct solution for the AI. Uh, and that AI and ML by its very nature is an iterative process that requires refinement. Um, you start off with some, uh, some data and some results and you're constantly looking at those uh, results and modifying them to continue to tweak and, um, and, and refine the results that you're going to get. So last thing I'll say is the keys to adoption success. Like where would you even start with an AI uh, project? Uh, you definitely want to smart, start small, in our opinion, and, and get some easy wins. Um, again, AI is so big that uh, there's a lot of promise with any project that you start, but you want to be able to get something that uh, solves a specific problem so that you can prove and then refine and build upon that solution what exactly uh, the result set is going to be and be able to you know, prove to stakeholders and yourselves that the AI solution is actually working. Um, it's very easy for these projects to become overambitious. So uh, trying to keep that site on that small, easy win at the beginning is very important. Uh, you do that by identifying immediate need and plan for those results. And uh, use that information to then build on a solution, meet those higher, loftier goals uh, as you continue to uh, proceed on your AI, ML, and uh, big data journey. So. Um, that's it for me. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any uh, questions or comments. And um, thank you for your uh, thank you for your attendance. Thank you, thank you, Scott. That was that was great. Uh, I hope everyone got uh, three new resources. If you want to get into AI, you want to learn more or apply it in your plans. Uh, uh, there is, you know, Volteric. There's Tasonics. There's IoTico that uh, will uh, can all help you. And now we can, uh, I apologize for the, the, the extended time, the, uh, we can all move to the main stage on, on the left hand uh, where, where Siemens will update us with their latest and greatest technologies. Thank you.